Uh, so the next and first, I guess, uh, full-length book in my aesthetics and uh, embodied theology uh, reading world tour is Mark Johnson's The Meaning of the Body. Uh, Mark Johnson is one half of the Lakoff and Johnson duo uh, who write about symbolic meaning and root metaphors. Uh, and here uh, he is writing in 2007, uh, kind of combining uh, kind of analysis on metaphoric and symbolic thought with cognitive science regarding embodiment and little couple dash flakes of uh, neurological perspectives in terms of hard natural science uh, and philosophy all mixed together. Uh, the emphasis of the book um, is first uh, a refutation uh, of something and then claims for something else. So what is being uh, refuted is uh, the mind-body dualism problem which in kind of short uh, explanation is to say that the mind and body are separate <clears throat> things. How do we deal with that? Uh, when the body dies, does the mind continue? Is it somehow connected to a soul or uh, an eternal spirit or a divine spark or uh, kind of a, a cognition that's purely other from another kind of noumenal realm? Uh, or perhaps uh, the mind is only the body and it exists as a result of neurological firings between synapses and something like that. Where do people come down on the mind-body problem it is one thing. What Johnson wants to say is there is no mind-body problem. And meaning is not a disembodied process at all. It is, in fact, uh, an embodied process. Hence the title uh, of the book, The Meaning of the Body, Aesthetics of Human Understanding. Uh, right off the top... Um, he wants to say, uh, I'm on page 9 here, uh, that Frege, who we often kind of consider uh, Gottlob Frege, the father of modern analytic philosophy, uh, he says that they are the fundamental unit of analytic philosophy is the proposition, uh, and therefore the fundamental unit of, kind of meaning making and uh, professional or academic thinking is the proposition. And uh, Johnson says, no, it is not. Uh, meaning, he says, traffics in patterns, images, qualities, feelings, and then only eventually concepts and propositions. So he wants to first negate the, the claim that there is something as the dualism of mind-body, and then negate that the unit of knowing is the proposition, replacing it, therefore, with feelings, intuitions, qualia, uh, and then only later concepts and propositions. And he draws throughout the text uh, on people like Antonio Damasio, uh, who's written a book, The Feeling uh, of What Happens, and a lot of other people who are working kind of in the in-between place of philosophy and cognitive science and psychology. Uh, more or less, uh, Johnson's uh, uh, thesis is kind of a seven-pointed one that he lays out right in the beginning. Uh, first, that there is no radical mind-body separation. Uh, second, that meaning is grounded in our bodily experience. Three, that reason is an embodied process. Four, imagination is tied to our bodily processes and can also be creative and transformative of experience. Five, there is no radical freedom. Uh, so here there's an argument that's akin to determinism, kind of materialist determinism. Uh, six, reason and emotion are inexorably intertwined. Seven, human spirituality is embodied, not uh, about the utterly radically other. Uh, and I find that this whole text uh, is a very interesting thing to consider for someone who does either philosophy um, of the analytic or continental kind and of folks who do theology as well. One of the most useful places uh, that Johnson has a pretty good articulation of something is this issue between the only, this kind of, what I'll be calling kind of the standard philosophical and, and by and large theological model of thinking and what he wants to call an embodied model of thinking. And in the standard model, um, thinking uh, is a Cognitive processes are disembodied. That's the assumption, kind of the a priori assumption is that thoughts, um, and you can kind of 
plug in in some kind of Aristotelian um, uh, and, and potentially platonic kind of otherness that what we're doing is we're, we're achieving uh, kind of truth via realms kind of pointed at the ultimate good or the ultimate truth or ultimate beauty or something like that. Uh, and then it comes down through the centuries as very disembodied cognition. Uh, and he points to um, uh, Ogden and Richards, uh, C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards, The Meaning of Meaning in 1923, and then A.J. Ayer's uh, Language, Truth, and Logic uh, as a, quote, logical empiricist ploy of claiming a rigid distinction between descriptive or cognitive meaning and a emotive meaning on the other, as if those are entirely different categories, and therefore descriptive and cognitive, i.e. actually describing the world as it is, is one thing, and an emotive thing isn't really describing anything, it's just entirely a state of being. So he kind of sets those up, he says the, the reason they're doing that is because their thinking, their cognition is entirely disembodied. And, and he writes um, on page 53, if you are skeptical about the claim that emotion is an essential aspect of meaning, which is what he wants to say, right? That intuition and experience and emotion is what meaning is about. It's not disembodied. Ask yourself what your experience of, quote, being skeptical about my claims that emotion is a central key in meaning really amounts to. He says, if you doubt that this is true, ask yourself about this doubt. As William James pointed out long ago and Charles Sanders Pierce before him, One's experience of doubt is a fully embodied experience of hesitation, withholding of assent, felt bodily tension, and general bodily restriction. Such felt bodily experiences are not merely accompaniments of doubt, rather, they are your doubt. The whole meaning of the situation you find yourself in is doubtful. Doubt retards or stops the harmonious flow of experience that preceded the thing about which you have doubt. You feel the restriction and tension in your diaphragm, your breathing, and perhaps in your gut. The meaning of doubt is precisely this bodily experience of holding back ascent and feeling a blockage of the free flow of experience towards new thoughts, feelings, and experiences. The category of doubt, which we so much hold as a cognitive or epistemological category, is in fact exactly an embodied one. Great point, Johnson. So one of the things that Johnson is doing, both implicitly and then uh, in later chapters explicitly, is taking issue with kind of a Kantian notion of, of meaning and aesthetics in, in general. Um, Kant distinguishes between the sublime and the beautiful. And um, roughly speaking, the sublime is... is, is masculine for Kant and the the beautiful is feminine and he equates these categories with the thing which causes you to step back and just be sh plunged into awe uh, fear and trembling wise in terms of what the sublime is and things that you just merely appreciate and uh, are charming uh, is the English translation of what Kant says happens to the beautiful so I think there's a comparison between kind of uh, uh, a mountain as sublime, kind of unapproachable, and like a meadow flower as beautiful. So there's this kind of disregard for the, quote, merely beautiful and a um, favor placed, at least in some capacity, uh, with the sublime. And it is no mistake, I think, that this is also associated with the masculine and the feminine. Uh, what Johnson um, wants to be doing is saying that part of the reason that thinking like that happens um, is because uh, we associate higher level thinking, right? True reasoning, real academic professional thinking, and here you can substitute in kind of Western analytical philosophy with disembodied thought. That is, if you're being emotional, somehow you are not being as good at thinking as the people who can completely and only rationally make their arguments. Uh, he thinks this is Bupkis, and uh, I think that this is Bupkis as well. Uh, what, what we have is uh, a gendered and uh, prejudiced view 
of the body, and here I would say influenced by uh, Hellenistic thought uh, regarding kind of the, the degeneration of the perfect forms into the human realm, and of Augustinian thought regarding the kind of ontological nature of the sinfulness of the flesh, uh, instituted in the very ways that we reify knowledge. The body is bad, in the Christian perspective, sinful, in the Greek perspective, because it's a, a poor reflection of the ultimate good in the kind of uh, the highest platonic form, the levels of platonic forms. And that kind of prejudice has worked itself all the way down into the mechanism of thought. What we even call thinking and reasoning is and must therefore be apart from the body. And Johnson says, more or less, this is only a, a function um, of uh, a schematic type of metaphors about what thinking is. It's not actually a, a, a true description of the way thought takes place. Throughout, uh, in Johnson's references to John Dewey, um, he's referencing American pragmatism uh, and also uh, Dewey's assertion that, that art um, is an uh, exemplar of human meaning making. And um, Dewey refers to thinking have an aesthetic quality. That is, the process of thinking itself has a feeling attached with it. And to this point, Johnson says, anyone who has ever reflected on their own thought processes, and certainly any writer or teacher, will know immediately what Dewey is talking about when he speaks of the aesthetics of thinking. How many times have you felt the frustration, tension, and dissonance of thinking that is not going well? And how many times have you felt the joy of fulfillment when you, quote, get it right, when thoughts flow and meaning, or argument, is carried forward in a satisfactory or satisfying way? There are aesthetic qualities to our thinking, just as much there are aesthetic qualities of accomplished creative performances in sports, music, painting, dance, and sculpture. On Dewey's view, all thought is situated, embodied, and value-laden, and so every instance of thinking is guided by its own distinctive aesthetic quality. Um, the, the point here uh, is kind of where Johnson ends up culminating. He says there are, there's a twofold hypothesis that he has as he moves into chapter 10. The first fold is that aesthetics is not just art theory, but should rather be regarded broadly as the study of how humans make and experience meaning, and two, the processes of embodied meaning in the arts are the very same ones that make linguistic meaning possible. Uh, thus, he seeks to continue his expansion of the notion of meaning far beyond the confines of words and sentences. His issue is that anything that doesn't conform to the lingu linguistic model as the basis of uh, meaning making kind of gets discounted as somehow fluffy and he points out that um, in fact uh, aesthetics is a m much minor field uh, more minor field than epistemology uh, ethics um, kind of philosophy of language any of these other fields are kind of infinitely more studied in analytic philosophy departments in the United States at least when in fact he suggests that aesthetics is actually how meaning is made in an embodied way and it deserves its own um, own interest to a greater degree. Um, he cites Dewey again and he says that Dewey went so far as to claim that art is experience in its most consummated, fully realized form. That artistic expression, that is kind of a fleshly, um, representational, visual, uh, embodied, tangible, temporal expression of meaning is the expression of meaning in its most full form. Not propositional writing, which is abstract and refers to thoughts only in kind of a discrete, discontinuous kind of way. Uh, as a theologian or someone who is interested in pastoral or church work or um, kind of theological thinking in general, I have to uh, say that I think that this is an incredibly instructive uh, model and a schematic place to start from, particularly for folks who kind of understand themselves as progressive 
or um, kind of socially minded, this is exactly the kind of thinking that can undergird the move from kind of an empire-driven philosophy and theology of abstraction and solidity and rigidness to a kind of fragmented, holistic um, theology that brings in voices from the margins. And it is no accident that those marginalized voices are often voices of women and people of color whose experience of the world doesn't match what, uh, what tends to be white men think of the world. And, and what Johnson says to this is one of the reasons that's the case is because the language, the register of thought in the West is, been, is restricted to this disembodied meaning. And when we crack open that nut, dissolve the mind-body problem, say it wasn't ever really a problem to begin with, it's only a problem if you maintain that discourse, and start thinking about experiences of the body, and start thinking about what the African-American philosophy looks like, what Toni Morrison has to say to the, the conversation, what uh, womenist theology and womenist theory and critique has to say, uh, and start to bring in other kinds of meaning and other kinds of ways of being and understanding, well, then we have uh, a much truer representation of the way that meaning is made in the human uh, being. And for folks that do theology and have just generally perceived this way because they think it's a good idea and that's what kind of good liberals do, what Johnson is saying is that, in fact, no, there's an epistemological and semiotic reason why that kind of methodology is useful. It's not just because it brings in the marginalized voice, it's because that voice is marginalized because it's not speaking in the discourse of disembodied meaning making. And a corrective to that is to include that voice and include that bodied perspective. Not just because they're marginalized, but the impetus of their marginalization is that they were forced out of authentic higher learning and higher knowledge seeking because they didn't speak right. Um, great text, uh, pretty accessible, I would say, and uh, certainly worth reading, although the Lakoff and Johnson uh, book from earlier on uh, it would probably be my first stop. Uh, this is certainly a, a real good follow-up and much more recent with a lot more um, kind of from the cognitive science and neurology in there that's up to date. So uh, good stuff. And next up is Elaine Scarry's weird little book on beauty and being just. What is even more important, though, is not only this quality is a significant motive in undertaking intellectually your mom, but also your mom. It says that right in there. It says that right in there.